part of our church. And then, of course, we love their church in New Zealand. Life Church has made an impact on so many people around the world. Okay, I uh, want to read two scripture verses and get right into it this morning. We are starting a new series called Armor. Somebody say Armor. armor. And I do want you to know that I've been trying to be hip. I've been trying to be cool. And I worked on graphics with my daughter, Phoebe, who actually is the cool one, does all the church's social media. She's good. And I made my own and I called this series Drip. Because I was like trying to be cool and I was trying to be young and I was like, Phoebe drip like clothes, like armor of God. And she's like, Dad, just stick to armor. And so I, I want you to know the youth are starting a series called Drip and I am doing one called Armor. But I want to read these scripture verses real quick. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 16 through 17, speaking of Jesus the Messiah, it says, He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained him. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with the robe of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. Ephesians says this, a final, Ephesians 6, chapter 10, verse 17 says this. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still uh, be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Father God, we know that there is a battle and a war. And we know that we have already won because of Jesus. I pray that today you would renew our minds. You would put faith inside of us. And we would leave changed. Father God, I thank you for that word that says, having done all to stand, stand. God, I pray that at Flourishing Church, you would raise up a group of people that no matter what is happening, they will continue to stand because you are for them, not against them. Help us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. When I was in uh, seventh grade, I just had gotten out of elementary school. So I went to Cedar Valley Elementary School. That went to sixth grade. And then, and I took, I actually walked to school, rode my BMX bike to school. I looked just like them in the movie E.T. I didn't look like E.T. I'm talking about the bikes that they had. And uh, I would ride. But then middle school came. And how many of you know that's a whole nother level? No more recess. We had to take the school bus to Briar Creek Middle School, that's where they gave you the lockers for the first time. This was like showers and PE class. I mean, all the different things that were like really weird and, and like, whoa, elementary school to junior high. And um, I, 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 my, I don't know what happened this year because it was an anomaly, but my mom took me to JCPenney's 
and we got the newest Levi's that had been bleached. They, they hadn't had bleached Levi's before. This was, this was, you know, late 80s or whatever, mid 80s, and I got bleached Levi's, and I got polo shirt, and it had a little alligator right here, and uh, my mom actually got me four of them, and I had one for four of the days of school, and then the fifth day, Friday, you were supposed to wear Briar Creek, you know, uh, uh, middle school swag, right? And so I, for four of the days, I had these polo collars, and I got there the first day of school, and an eighth grader had popped their polo collar up in the air, and I immediately, under peer pressure, did the exact same thing and walked around Briar Terrace Middle School with swag and drip and confidence <laughs> because my mom had finally gotten me good school clothes. And uh, you should have seen the confidence that I had in seventh grade. In fact, my friend Mark Requa said, change your elective. I was in woodshop and he's like, change it. He's like, my older brother who's in high school told me if you're going to get a girlfriend, join choir. We'll be the only guys. And sure enough, 150 girls and only me and Mark Requa. And those of you who know, know I cannot sing if my life <laughs> depended on it. But with my collar popped, and in middle school choir with 7th and 8th grade women, <laughs> I got a note passed to me from an 8th grade girl. In the very corner of the note, there was a little box that said, Will you go out with me? Yes or no? Rachel, I want you to know I said no because I was thinking of you in my future. That uniform of a junior high insecure kid was so vital. If you're a lawyer, you suit up. If you're a fireman, come on, you wear the fire suit. If you're a police officer, you wear the body armor. There are so many different professions that we know the drip, the armor, the outfit is so important. And Paul writes, knowing what was said about the Messiah in Isaiah, he begins to tell the church there at Ephesus and here we are in L.A. 2,000 years later. Hey, there is something you've got to put on that is going to make or break your spiritual life. And so if we know it in the natural, how it changed my confidence as a seventh grader, how much more can we leave today knowing that the armor of God is available? It'll change every area in our life. How many of you believe that? Come on, say amen. amen. Come on, lift up those hands towards heaven. Say this with me. Say, Father God, Father God. I, believe I believe you've given me, given me. Armor. armor. Help me today, Help me today. Get, it. get it. Help me today. Receive it by faith and to use it every day of my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. So just real, real quick, I've got Manny here. Manny, would you come up here? And, and, and uh, how many of you love Manny? Come on, Manny and Amanda. And, and you, you're looking pretty good already. I mean, you have already got, definitely you've got the shoes of peace. Look at those. Doc Martens have to be that. And, and, and so um, I just wanted you to just, just quickly, we won't, we, we, this is going to be a series. And, and so um, this, this won't go long. But uh, this is first, you know, if you're going to be a Roman soldier, you've got you to gotta look Roman. And so if you could put that on real quick. Uh, yeah, that's for the head. That's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
everybody go, toga. No, don't, don't, do, don't do that. Okay, okay. And so, and then, you know, you got to, you kind of got to wear this from behind. I love it. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's got the move. E2 rotate. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, and, and so the Bible talks about some things. You got to have the, you got to have the helmet of salvation. So yeah, yeah, very good. Helmet of salvation. Good, good, good. You have to have the belt of truth. Gotta yes, got to have the belt of truth. Go ahead, right, right, right around there. Let me grab that. Yes. <laughs> Come on, the belt of truth. There you go. You got to have, uh, okay, so I knew you had boots on, and I was going to have him take off his uh, shoes and put this on, but I thought that would take too long. And so you, you got to shod your feet, the Bible talks about. And so we'll just, we'll, we'll kind of do it like this. Is that okay? Yeah, look at that. Looking good. Uh, uh, go flex for your wife real quick. Just flex for her. Yeah, like, oh, the belt. Man, the helmet. Man, it all came off. Yeah, come here, come here, come here, come here. I'll, I'll do this other one. We, no, the best soldier. That was really good because that's like practical, isn't it? That's like, uh, how many of you as Christians kind of feel like that sometimes? Like you're here on Sunday and it's all good, but Monday is like a hot mess. <laughs> Nobody else, just, just us. Come on, hot mess. Uh, trying to hold his belt and fight at the same time. Okay, good, good, good. Helmet of salvation. Don't go anywhere. Feet shot. And, and then the Bible says, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, uh, where, where is, is Dana here this morning? Dana, don't make fun of me. Because Dana at our men's conference pulled out like 17 swords because he collects them. And then now I've got this. And I don't think he has one of these from Hasbro. But anyhow, uh, uh, you, you got the shield of faith. Yeah, put the shield of faith. Awesome, awesome. And the sword of the spirit. Come on. Very good. One more time. Oh, oh, is this, are you posing on this side too? Oh, okay, good. Very good. Okay, okay. Can we give it up for Manny right here? Very good. You can be seated. So, so before you're seated, yeah, did you get a picture? That was great. Um, before you're seated, in all reality, every, this is going to be like Sunday school for some of us. How many of you all went to Sunday school? Who didn't go to Sunday school? Raise your hand high. Yes. We love you. But we're going to go through this in a very in-depth, every week we're going to talk about Helmet of Salvation. We're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness, which I didn't even give you. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the belt of truth. We're going to talk about the shoes of peace. We're going to talk about every single one of them and make them, how do you use that in 2024? How does that apply in your marriage? How does that apply at your workplace? How does that apply maybe in a situation that you keep on getting defeated in? God doesn't want you and I defeated. And so we're going to learn how to put on the armor of God. Amen. And I love this. He, we didn't practice it, but I love that the belt fell off. I love that I forgot to get the breastplate of righteousness. It's still in my car. <laughs> I, 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 I love this that the shoe would have taken a little bit of time, so we kind of did it without the shoe. Because oftentimes, this is actually real life when it comes to the armor of God. We're here on Sunday. As soon as we start to walk away, things start falling off. And we're going to learn how to keep on the armor of God. Amen. Come on, can you give it up for Manny? Yes. A couple things, just real quick, just some history about this letter that Paul is writing. The first thing that um, I want you to know is that 
Paul is probably writing this letter in about 62 AD, which means 30 years, 33 years, 30 years or so after Jesus has uh, resurrected uh, and then now gone to heaven. Now the disciples have been multiplying and growing and Paul is writing a letter to the church at Ephesus. And what's interesting about that is Paul has actually spent three years in Ephesus. So these aren't strangers he's writing to. In fact, the Bible tells us that he spoke every single day for three years in one of the town halls. Uh, So he's preached to this church over a thousand times. He has spoke to them and spoke to them. And so now he's writing to them. Now he is actually in jail in Rome, guarded by a Roman soldier. So when he's talking about this, this isn't just abstract. He is seeing it right there. And he's speaking to a group of people he has been with. I, I, I remember when Rachel and I, we first started the church, we had this couple. They were wonderful and they helped serve in the church and they worked in the nursery. And she pretty much helped start running the nursery. Um, and she would tell us who've had three kids what was supposed to be done. And we were like, yeah, that's good. But, you know, maybe just do this. But she had never had kids. And so she kind of had this, this attitude towards us on how it should be. And we just kind of smirked and, and thought to ourselves, let's talk about this again after you've had two kids. And we'll see if that's the way it is. Because how many of you know that first kid that you have, you're so careful with? You use uh, wipes for everything. You are like so super careful. Second kid, you're like, oh, the first kid didn't get hurt. So we don't have to really pay that much attention. The third kid, they could be eating dirt and then eating. And you're like, fine with me. He's going to end up okay. (laughs) But Paul is not writing to someone he doesn't know. And Paul isn't writing about something he doesn't know about. He knows them and he has uh, a first hand of what the armor of God is. Second thing, he's writing to Ephesians, this church, has some of the early church's most influential leaders. He's, there is a, 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 a Priscilla and Aquila. He's writing to where Timothy is pastoring. He is writing to where Apollos learned the gospel. He is writing to where John, before he is exiled to Patmos, is from Ephesus. And so he's writing to leaders. He's writing to those early in the faith But he's also writing to some generals in the faith. And so no matter where you're at in your faith journey, this is an important uh, observation and illustration that he wanted to get. It wasn't just for baby Christians. It wasn't just for Sunday school. It was actually for all of us to get a hold of. He was writing it to a church that was actually being persecuted Because they were making a difference in the culture. See, Christians will never be persecuted if we're not making a difference. People will just let us be and they'll just let us hide out. But what actually happened in Ephesus is so many people stopped worshiping the idols that the idol makers started noticing that their paycheck was getting smaller and smaller. And so they, they caused a huge riot to say these Christians are turning the world upside down because we're not making as much money on our idols as we used to because people stopped worshiping the idols and they started worshiping Jesus. In fact, the Bible says in Revelations that Jesus says to the church, he writes a letter to the church at Ephesus and he sees, I see That you have overcome like adversity. You have overcome this this attack that's been against you. So he's writing to a church that is is being persecuted. It's not, it's not, it's easiest. He's writing to a church that Christianity is not very popular. He's also writing to a society 
that is very, very uh, messed up sexually. They're worshiping idols and they're at a pivotal place geography, which is now uh, modern day Turkey. They were on the crossroads of trade. And so everything that was in that city was all about the hustle and everything was about making the money. And there was ill, ill. Even uh, Paul writes earlier about treating the lower class. There was all these class wars. There was the rich and then there was the poor. And there were all these issues that Paul is writing to the culture of the city. But he wasn't just writing to the culture of the city. He's writing to the culture of the church because there were two types of people in the church at Ephesus and they weren't getting along. There were Republicans and there were Democrats. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I'll stick to the Bible. Oh, there were the vaccine and not the vaccine. Oh, no, 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 no. I got I to gotta stick to the Bible. No, no, no. There were two different types of people in the church, and they did not get along. So he's writing to the, the, the Gentile believers who were coming into church, and they were bringing in philosophy instead of theology. And then there were the Jewish Christians who were bringing in religion instead of relationship. And in this church, there's disunity. And Paul is having to address it. And he's addressing it by saying, put on the full armor of God. Not only that, but but we also see that Paul it says the word finally. Somebody say finally. finally. He's been with them for three years. He's done an hour categorizing. He's done five or oh, six chapters. And then he's closing and he says finally. And it's not a finally like a PS. No, this word in the Greek finally is the equivalent of saying, hey, I want your attention. Everything else has been good, but what I'm about to say now, I really want you to listen. This is, this is the good stuff. Uh, back in the day when Apple used to release a product, uh, they would always have, uh, you know, the guy come out and do the presentation. And uh, he would always talk about all the stats and all this stuff. And they'd do the keynote. And, and then he'd just about, Steve Jobs was just about to get done. And he'd walk away. And then right as he was walking he was away, he'd go, oh, and one more thing. And that is when he would introduce the iPhone. He would introduce the iPod Shuffle. How many of you remember when that was introduced? That was amazing. Uh, uh, he'd always, and so Paul's doing the same thing. Hey, here's all this stuff that's very important, but I really, really, really want you to pay attention because this can change your life. So this morning, with just the few minutes that I have, I just want to set us up because each week we're going to talk about a different part, a different armor of God, how it applies and how it can change our life. And when Paul writes this in Ephesians, he uses the word church for the very first time. And when he uses the word church, what I mean by it is he uses church in other letters, but this is the first time he's ever used church as universal, not just local. And so this is a truth for all of us that if we can get, it'll change our life. Amen? Yeah. Is that okay? Anybody got a little bit of background today? So now when we get into it, you'll know. So I just want to talk about just a few things this morning that um, from this beginning of the text, not before we get into the full armor, that just can help us. The first thing that I would, and the point is already up there, awesome. The first thing that I would say is make no mistake, we are in a war. It's quiet in here this morning. How many of you know we are in a spiritual yeah. war? Yeah. Half of you. The rest of you don't believe it. Come on. How many of you know that there is a spiritual war? Jesus says this. The thief comes to kill, to steal, 
and to destroy. Paul begins to write that there is a spiritual battle taking place. And there are some things in our life that we better realize this is actually a spiritual battle. Because if you don't know it's a spiritual battle and you act in the flesh, you're going to lose every single time. But when you know that there is a spiritual war, then you know, okay, we're going to win this war, but we're not going to win this war in the flesh. We're going to win this in the spirit. And one of the greatest tricks, C.S. Lewis said it like this in Screwtape's letters, one of the devil's main strategies is to convince humans that he doesn't exist. Right? Oh, it's, not a, it's just a little red guy with a little pitchfork. Right? You've seen the cartoon. You ever seen the cartoons where there's the angel on one side and then there's the devil on the other side and the angel is kind of wimpy and the pitchfork guy is kind of cute with his little... And, and, and it's kind of like tries to make it that way. But w- the Bible says that, that, that Paul writes to us that the devil actually has strategies. We are not naive of his strategies, his devices. He actually has a strategy to destroy Christians. Ah, oh, I know what I'll do to help destroy that marriage. Oh, I know what I'm going to do to help destroy that future, that destiny. Oh, I know what I'm going to do to cause them to get offended. I know what I'm going to do to cause them to leave the church. Studies from Barna show that since COVID, over 20 million people who were in church have left the church. Do you think that that was by accident? No, the enemy had a strategy. I'm going to use this moment to try to attack. And so if you try to win that in the natural, you'll lose. But when you know it's the spiritual, then you know what to do. And you can begin to have victory in Jesus' name. So the first thing that I would say is, make no mistake, we are in a war. The second thing that I would say is, make no mistake, not everything is a war. Does that make sense? Yes, we are in a spiritual war, but don't be like Saturday Night Live and the church lady and blame it on the devil for everything that happens in your life. Does that make sense? We are in a war. We understand the war, but we are also wise enough and flowing with the Holy Spirit enough to know that not everything in our life is an attack from the devil. I parked at Hermosa Beach by the pier, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to be five minutes to go get a Starbucks. I'll get the Starbucks, and I'll come back. I don't necessarily need to pay the meter because it'll only be five minutes. How many of you know the devil is a liar? (laughs) Because when I got back, there was a white piece of paper on my windshield that if I would have paid the few quarters, the 75 cents, I would have avoided the $395 parking in a handicapped spot on a handicapped person. No, I'm just kidding. That was too much. Sorry, too much, too much. But I can't blame the devil for my stupidity. Yeah. Yeah. It's quiet in here. That was your one time to amen the pastor saying he was dumb. Amen. <laughs> D- does that make sense? There was a, there was a farmer and uh, he, he, he had a horse and the horse ran away and the neighbor said, oh, that's bad luck. That's bad luck that the horse ran away and the farmer goes, maybe. The next day, uh, the horse came back with six wild horses And the neighbor goes, wow, that's good luck that the horse came back and brought six wild horses. Farmer goes, maybe. Well, the next day after that, his son rode one of the wild horses and broke his leg. So the neighbor goes, oh, bad luck. Your son broke his leg. And the farmer goes, 
maybe. The next day, the army came to draft people into the army, and they saw the son with a broken leg and said, you can stay home. And the neighbor goes, good luck there. And the farmer said, maybe. The reality is we live in a broken world where there are natural laws and there are laws like gravity that you fell and it wasn't necessarily the devil that caused you to fall. It's a thing that we're under the law. And so we have to be cognitive that we're in a spiritual war, but don't go crazy on us and start being and like, I've got to get to the high place to come across these demons. And you've got to go rent a hot air balloon so that you can get higher than the demons. So that you can go to war against the spiritual um, person of the city. Most of the people that I know that are always talking spiritual warfare aren't victorious in their own life. So we want to be balanced with understanding this is the enemy. This is life. And if you can learn that, you'll be victorious. If you're always, I don't even know there was a devil. You're going to get beat up. And if you're always, LeBron James is six foot six and six inches. Oh, You're going to be defeated. But as Christians, we understand. Yep, there's an enemy. Yep, there's nature. I'm not going to blame the enemy because I went to McDonald's straight every day for a year. Come on. I'm not going to blame the enemy when, when there's, I haven't dated my wife in a year. And now he's coming against my marriage. Maybe you should date your wife. Does that make sense? But then there's other times where there's an attack against your marriage. And you've got to recognize, whew, if this isn't between us. This is the enemy trying to bring something between us. And we're going to have to win in the spirit yeah. to have victory over that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we talk about spiritual war in the next couple of weeks, I want us to be balanced and aware. Yeah. There's always a war, but not everything is a war. Yeah. There's always a war. But not everything. And does that make sense? And if, you, if you're ever too much on one side, I think that's a good place to actually get defeated. But if we're aware of both, we can have victory. Is that okay? Just a couple more. Is that all right? Uh, just two more. Maybe three. Maybe five. Maybe six. <laughs> maybe seven. No, I only have a couple more. Uh, 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 number three, we never fight for victory. We fight from victory. When I read this text, I have a tendency. How many of you are works-oriented? You feel like, like a, one person, no one else even cares about works. Uh, come on, anybody like, if you, you like uh, I'm a works person. Yesterday, uh, Rachel got back late from the women's conference. While she was getting back, Silas and I cleaned the house. And we vacuumed and we uh, got everything. And, and, and I'm a works guy, so I do all this stuff. And, and, and so I make it, and I remind her, and I show her every single thing that I did. <laughs> like, I'll be like, I will show her the dust I cleaned. I will show her the dish. And, 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 and so I'm kind of like works oriented because I know if I do all of this and then later on at night I hear Marvin Gaye playing in the bedroom I'm like yes the works paid off hallelujah too much information I know but anyhow I'm a works person and so when I read this text put on the armor of God war stand I tend to start getting works oriented that I can have victory if I will do all these things. Oh, I've been defeated recently. I'm not having victory recently. So now I need to go to battle and I need to put up the shield and I need to do this. But we never have victory 
<laughs> we never fight for the victory. We actually fight from victory. We've already won. It changes the whole thing. Changes everything. Going into it hoping to win or going into it knowing we already won. And the greatest thing the enemy can do would be the greatest thing. It's not sickness. It's not divorce. The greatest thing the enemy can do is to separate us for eternity from our loving Heavenly Father. And Jesus already defeated that. The greatest thing the enemy could do would be to try to keep you and I from eternity with God. And Jesus already defeated our greatest adversary. So that doesn't mean we won't have problems here. Doesn't mean we won't have battles here. Doesn't mean that there won't be wars and losses here. But we've already won the big war. We've already, he's already won the battle for us. It changes everything when you know what the end of the book says. Come on, it changes everything when you know what Jesus already did. That I am going into battle, but I am not going into battle to try to have victory. I'm going into it with his victory there is nothing you can do enemy nothing you can do to actually eternally defeat me there might be some earthly things that are tough but I know at that worst you could do I've already had the victory in Jesus Christ come on can we lift up our heads towards heaven and say Jesus Thank you. I don't have to fight for victory. But I get to fight from victory because of what you did. Come on, can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? Say this with me. Point to your neighbor and say, it's not your armor. Point to your neighbor and say, it's God's armor. Come on, say, it's not your armor. It's God's armor. Rachel's number seven of ten kids. You have ten kids, school clothes. She didn't get the J.C. Penney's drip that I did in seventh grade. School clothes. It was tough. Ten kids. She's number seven. When it came to school clothes for the Smith family, they didn't get a lot of choices, a lot of style. But Rachel had a cousin who was one year older, and she was actually the only child. And so her aunt and uncle bought her cousin all the newest and coolest clothes. So Rachel, her experience going into high school, she went in with the coolest clothes because her cousin six months earlier had grown out of them barely worn some still have the tags still on them she never even got a chance to wear and Rachel would get these bags of brand new clothes cool clothes like bongo cool clothes like colors of Benetton. These are all 80s clothes and, 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 and swatches and, and all these kind of clothes. And so her brothers, <laughs> they didn't have any style, but Rachel coming to school, hanging out with the cool kids, come on, sitting at the cool table at the cafeteria. She didn't earn it. She didn't buy it. They weren't actually hers to begin with. But she had an older cousin who passed him down. Jesus has a set of armor that he's already tried out. That's why I quoted the verse in Isaiah, the breastplate of righteousness. It's not our armor. It's not about 
us trying to create the armor, buy the armor, earn the armor. We don't have to do any of it. We've got, and the one translation says it, an older brother, but I don't want to minimize. We have a Messiah. We have a Savior. His name is Jesus, and he says to you and I, I have an armor that I have already defeated the enemy with. He tried to kill me, and on the third day, I rose again, and I'm going to give you some armor because the no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. I don't want you to go get some armor from J.C. Penney's. I don't want you to go try to manufacture your own. I'm going to give you my armor. And so you and I can say, I put on the armor of God. And guess what? The enemy is not going to win because he couldn't defeat him 2,000 years ago. And he can't defeat me now when I wear his armor, not my armor. Amen? Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to close. A couple weeks ago, Silas was wearing a Yankees jersey. Yeah, I'll talk to you guys in just a second. And I was highly disappointed. And I, the quality of it was really nice. And I know his money situation. Or lack of, come on, right? So I was like, did he get a Yankees jersey? Like, who? He don't have money for... He no, 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 no. So I flipped the tag because I wanted to see, was it like, was this an official jersey? Like, where did he get this jersey? And on the name, Yudko was written on the back of it because their son, Dylan, a few years older, few sizes larger outgrew the jersey and Pam wrapped it up gave it to Rachel unbeknownst to me because we would have had a bonfire in Jesus name had someone else's name on it it belonged to someone else but it had been passed we get the armor of God. If you look on your tag, it says Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That thing has been passed down to you and I, and we get to put it on. And when we put it on, we can stand. And having done all the stand, come on, we keep on standing. I don't know what you're in the middle of. I don't know what battle that you are fighting. I don't know what the enemy is trying to do in your life. I don't know the heartache, the anxiety, the stress, the frustration when it comes to relationships. I don't know what battle you're in the middle of, but I can tell you something. You don't have to try to have the victory on your own. There is an armor of God that is available and it has his name on it, the name of Jesus. Come on. And you can begin to have the victory and can I tell you that there will be people just like I was with Silas where did you get that there will be people wondering how come you're able to walk in victory how come you're able to change that situation how come the addiction has stopped with you how come you're having and seeing peace when they're living in a world that there is no peace and you can say come on it was never me look at the tag it isn't me it is Jesus. I want to pray with you. Would you close your eyes, bow your head? This morning you would say, I'm in the middle of a battle. I need the armor of God. I'm a Christian, but Israel, I am getting knocked to and fro. I'm not standing. I'm moving. Today you just need some special prayer. We want to pray with you. We want to pray that God would etch his name on his armor in your life. That's you. Just raise your hand right where you're at. I want to pray with you and for you. Father God, every person with their hand raised, we declare in the name of Jesus, 
supernatural strength. We declare your word says, having done all the stand, stand, and we don't stand on our own. We stand with the tag written Jesus on the back of the armor. God, I pray for supernatural strength, a strength that only comes from you. We declare every scheme, every plan, every plot of the enemy is defeated. It was defeated 2,000 years ago. We don't pray for victory. We pray in victory. In the name of Jesus, we declare supernatural strength. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, would you say amen? Come on, would you say amen? Come on, if you receive that, would you say amen? Come on. Hallelujah. One last time. One last time. Manny and Amanda are coming up here to close. Good. One last time, would you close your eyes? accident this morning Wednesday night we've been praying for you didn't know your name didn't know your face didn't know your story but we knew that there would be people here today you've been battling on your own and you have been being defeated but we knew about a savior we knew about the Son of God, Jesus. And Isaiah said he saw our condition and he did something about it. He died and defeated death and defeated sin and defeated the separation that we would have had from God for eternity because of all the things that we've done. And Jesus defeated that. And like I said, I don't think you're here by accident. I believe this was foreordained. I believe this was predestined. I believe that God put it in his calendar that today was a day he was going to have an encounter with you. And you would leave this place changed. You would leave this place looking at the tag of your life, no longer saying your name but it would be saying the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I don't know who or where you're from or what you've been in the middle of, but I do know that this moment is sacred. And this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or this morning, you'd say, I've backslidden, I've walked away. I want to rededicate, recommit. I'm a prodigal son or daughter, and I want to surrender make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I want him to etch his name all over my life. I'm simply going to count to three, and if that's you, right where you're standing, I just want you to lift up that hand high enough and long enough where you're at so that I know who I'm praying with and praying for. We just did that just a second ago, people praying for supernatural strength. Now we're praying for your eternity. Now we're praying for your salvation. Now we're praying for you to see victory in every area of your life, surrendering your life to Jesus. Come on, one. Come on, two. Come on, three. Just lift up that hand if that's you. Awesome. I see that hand. Anybody else? Yep. I see that hand. Awesome. I see that hand. Yes. Awesome. Anybody else? Just lift it up high enough and long enough so that I can see it. Awesome. Awesome. I see those hands. Awesome. Yep. In the very back, I see that hand. Anybody else? Awesome. Okay. You can put those hands down. Come on. You can put those hands down. Everybody say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, this morning, I surrender. I've tried to do it on my own, but I can't do it. I am not enough. So Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Jesus, thank you for going to battle, dying for me. And on the third day, you conquered death so that I could live a victorious life. From today on, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be in your house 
planted. And Holy Spirit, fill me right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, what are they doing in heaven? Come on, what are they doing in heaven for people to